Now that we've derived the expression for the Schwarzschild metric, and now that we've proven Birkhoff's theorem, we've dealt with much of the algebra that's involved in the Schwarzschild solution. In this video, I'm going to dive deep into the geometry of the Schwarzschild solution and specifically talk about embedding diagrams, which will ultimately lead to the derivation of Flam's paraboloid. But let's first define what we mean by embedding diagrams. Embedding diagrams are simplified depictions of the curved space-time manifold that show you how the space-time hypersurface curves as a result of the mass and energy distributed within it. Let me further illustrate what I mean by deriving the equation for the embedding diagram corresponding to our Schwarzschild solution. Recall from a previous video that we found the Schwarzschild solution and obtained the following as the line element corresponding to the space-time outside a single, spherically symmetric, uncharged, non-rotating mass. This is what that line element looked like for our Schwarzschild solution, specifically our exterior Schwarzschild solution for the space-time outside the mass. Note that R sub S is the Schwarzschild radius, which is related to the mass M of the spherical object as follows. G is the universal gravitational constant, and C is the speed of light in vacuum. Recall also that T is the time coordinate, R is the radial coordinate, theta is the angle from the positive x-axis, and phi is the angle from the positive z-axis. We'll start by considering a time slice in our Schwarzschild geometry, where we let the time coordinate be a constant. If we do that, then the dt becomes zero, and the Schwarzschild metric reduces to the following. Now, the reason we can just consider a time slice is that no matter what time we look at, this spatial component of the Schwarzschild metric remains the same. It doesn't depend on time. So regardless of whether the time is 1, 2, or 10 units, the geometry of the Schwarzschild solution, the spatial part of the Schwarzschild solution, is still the same. Let's make some more slices. We'll consider a slice of space-time where phi is pi by 2 and d phi is 0. So that means we're confining ourselves to a two-dimensional surface because we're setting d phi to 0, and the two-dimensional surface we're confining ourselves to is one in which phi is fixed at pi by 2. If we now use these sub-slices, here's what our Schwarzschild metric becomes. As an aside, the reason we can just arbitrarily set our phi to pi by 2 is if we draw out our scenario with the non-rotating spherical mass in the center of our space-time, then no matter what point I look at outside the sphere, I can always reorient my z-axis such that my point, be it a, b, c, or wherever, my point always corresponds to phi equals pi by 2. So that's why I've set my phi to pi by 2 a priori, because it simplifies the expression for ds squared, and I can do this without really any loss of generality. Now the ds squared we're left with only has the r and theta components, and this is the point where I find the equation for the surface of my embedding diagram. To do this, I need to embed the two-dimensional space-time surface corresponding to my ds squared into three-dimensional Euclidean space. If I embed the surface into Euclidean space, I can easily visualize it, and that's why I'm doing this. Since I've got the r and theta already, I need to define a third coordinate, which I'll call z, and this is going to represent a height coordinate. So with r, theta, and z as my height, the three-dimensional Euclidean space and coordinate system I'll use will involve cylindrical coordinates. Recall that the line element in Euclidean space corresponding to cylindrical coordinates is given by the following. Now, if I want to draw the space-time surface represented by my simplified Schwarzschild metric in Euclidean space, if I want to draw my embedding diagram, I need to equate the line element in cylindrical coordinates with the Schwarzschild line element. This will allow me to create a differential equation that will give me z as a function of r and theta, which I'll use to plot the surface corresponding to my embedding diagram. The reason that I equate the two ds squared equations is that if I am to embed this 2D slice of Schwarzschild spacetime in three-dimensional Euclidean space, the distance or separation, the ds squared between any two points on the two-dimensional slice, the first ds squared equation, must equal the distance between those same points when I draw them in a three-dimensional Euclidean space on the embedding diagram surface. And when I equate the right-hand sides of these line elements, this is the equation I'll end up with. I'll simplify by canceling out the d theta term and dividing both sides by dr squared to get the following differential equation for z in terms of r. Isolating dz by dr and simplifying the expression in the square root gives me the following. If I solve for z by integrating the right-hand side with respect to r, this is the integral expression I'll end up with. This integral is incredibly easy to evaluate because we've got a simple square root in the denominator. If we evaluate the integral, this is what we get, where c is some integration constant. 
If I arbitrarily select my height coordinate z such that the value of z is 0 at my Schwarzschild radius r sub s, then my integration constant will be 0, so my z of r becomes the following. Now since r is my radial coordinate, I can convert it to the x and y Cartesian coordinates by using r as the square root of x squared plus y squared. This will help me come up with an equation for my surface as a function of my Cartesian coordinates x and y. Now this equation, which I'll call equation 1, is the equation for a surface called Flam's paraboloid. I've drawn it here for your reference. Now this embedding diagram for the Schwarzschild metric, this Flam's paraboloid, comes up in lots of media surrounding general relativity. General relativity, after all, is the study of how mass and energy are related to space-time curvature, and the easiest, most convenient depiction of space-time curvature is Flam's paraboloid for the classic scenario of a non-rotating spherical mass. I've even used Flam's paraboloid in a thumbnail of one of my general relativity videos, but depicting the space-time surface with Flam's paraboloid is fraught with risks and can be a big source of confusion, with a lot of people being misled. I'm going to touch on one of the reasons for this here, but I'll do a more detailed animated video later on on why embedding diagrams can be misleading. So one reason that using Flam's paraboloid is risky is that the surface Flam's paraboloid represents is a space-like surface. If we go back up to our derivation for the equation of Flam's paraboloid, we'll actually see that we set dt to zero as one of the first steps to isolate a time slice in Schwarzschild geometry. This was done to simplify things by just looking at a single time slice, but when the dt, the time separation between two events, is zero, and your spatial separations are non-zero, that means that any two events occurring on Flam's paraboloid are space-like separated. And if they're space-like separated, those events cannot be causal. You'll recall this if you've seen my videos in Special Relativity. So I can't draw a planet moving on Flam's paraboloid or a particle traversing it, because mass-containing objects can only travel in time-like separated paths. Each point on that path has to be causally related to the previous one, and this cannot happen on a space-like surface like in this embedding diagram. Now there's many more caveats that come with embedding diagrams, but I'm going to touch over them in the next video. I'd like to thank the following patrons for their support, and if you enjoyed the lesson, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan signing out.